In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God is one. Amen. Good morning, God bless you everybody. So, um, I can see the children there, Sabah Khair. Say Sabah Al Nur. And uh, James, good morning. I'm feeling much better, thank you very much. Uh, my blood pressure is still too high, but hopefully I'll be hearing from the doctor later on about that as well. Um, so, what is going on? It's um, a bit of a disappointing looking sort of day. It's suddenly um, nice amount of wind, nice amount of sunshine, not too cold. And the result of that was that I was able to do a load of washing first thing this morning. And before I put it out very early, actually. And uh, when I left the house at half seven, um, I was able to bring it in because it was all dry. I remember. Um, somebody once saying there's nothing, no finer sight than seeing a line full of washing. <laughs> um, and I, I, I know that feeling now. I remember thinking at the time this was rather bizarre. Um, but uh, there we go. Anyway, it's amazing what makes people excited. Uh, good morning, Suzanne. God bless you. you put on the message and attract it. Good morning. Oh, there we are. Good morning, Father and everyone. And good morning to you as well. Um, Anton, happy Monday. Uh, that is, that's good. I hope things are well with you. Not too hot. I've got plenty I need to get on with today, so I'm going to be getting on with it uh, with alacrity. So there we are. Now, today we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 22 to 31. There's a lot in this, but if it's, I was thinking about dividing it up into small bits, but rather than do that, because I think we've dealt with some of it, and we'll be coming back to it at some point, um, coming back to something else at some point within it, it's, it's also in Matthew, um, I thought what we'd do is we'd, we'd see the whole lot, do the whole lot in one go, and see how we get on. We can always come back to it another day if we need to. So here we go. The context of this is, um, do you remember there's a man wanting the Lord to arbitrate between him and his brother over their inheritance? Now this in itself is not the bad thing, but this man is looking at God. And looking at God, he is thinking about things that are worldly, things that are not really important, when you're standing before God, there are other things to worry about. And the Lord then starts to talk to him and everybody else, his disciples particularly, about the dangers of worldliness, of possessions, and about being anxious of things, where the word anxious means distracted, being distracted about things that are not eternal. There are things that are eternal, and those things you need to worry about, and the things that are not eternal that you can allow God to worry about. Okay? So that's part of the um, background to all of this. So verse 22, chapter 12. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you of little faith? And do not seek what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or have an anxious mind, for all these things the nations of the world seek after. 
and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Okay, some more people turned up. Vicky, good morning. And Gary and Kenneth, good evening. Um, and Tony, good morning. Bonjour. And Chao. Uh, uh, God bless you. Um, I missed everybody yesterday, but everything was wonderful in Worcester. Uh, a number of new people and lots of lovely people to to meet and really wonderful atmosphere. Rather like here, similar sort of place to go to church. Um, really good, energetic, thoughtful people. That's despite the fact that quite a number of people happen to be away for different reasons. Anyway, um, they weren't marrying wives or looking at um, patches of ground. <laughs> but anyway, there we go. Now, one of the things, of course, that St. Luke has almost certainly done here, because there's too many things the Lord has shoved in together here for a sermon or a talk or something like that, is that St. Luke has pulled together the different sayings the Lord has about covetousness and about being over-anxious about your worldly life. And so he's grabbed all these things and shoved them all into the sink in one go. And um, you're meant to read them all together because they all of them sit together in that way. But in terms of time or the sermon or whatever it might have been at the, at the time, uh, each of these things is um, really a sermon by itself. So you have the ravens, the, the birds, the adding a cubit, and all that sort of stuff. Each of these sayings are their own particular saying, like a proverb, that the Lord, that uh, Luke has shoved into the same pot. Okay, so that's that's the context, that's the background. And the anxious part there, if you think about it in terms of being distracted by, then that gives you something of the feeling of the word itself. Sometimes it is uh, translated over-anxious, but the whole idea is you, you shouldn't be, you know, this is not the be-all and end-all of life, getting a big house, decorating it with fine wallpaper, 60 quid a roll, <laughs> probably more than that now, 120 pounds per roll, um, having you know, the, the best food delivered in a hamper from Fort Number Mason, um, the, or, or three million pounds delivered it from Fort Number Mason. <laughs> if, you're, if you're British, you'll see what that's to do with, to with Prince Charles. Um, you know, this is um, this is not the be all and end all of life. These things, a hundred years from now, nobody's going to look at your wallpaper, your fancy clothing, or anything like that. This is the sort of thing that the Lord is talking about. So, look for something that's actually worth worrying about. Don't be distracted. Be attracted. Don't be distracted from God by all these worldly concerns, but be attracted to God by God. Okay? Then you know, won't need to worry about all these other stuff. You'll take no thought of them. Like I was talking with some, we had a lovely couple come to the monastery the other day, um, a couple of days ago, and uh, one of the deacons, well, both of them actually were talking about St. Humphrey who, as you know, is dressed in his own hair. He took so little notice of um, worldly things, he went around naked. Uh, in the Orthodox Church, this shows him with an extremely long beard. Uh, somewhere or other, I have a, a little print that I picked up in Rome when I was about 25, so a long time ago, nearly 40 years ago. Um, from St. Humphrey's Monastery in Rome that <laughs> shows uh, St. Humphrey looking woolly like a sheep. <laughs> so this wool all the way around him. <laughs> I'm sure that's you know, very Roman Catholics so we're looking at that. It's just <laughs> seeing this in the shop and thinking, I was distracted. I thought, 
that's something I must clutter up my life with. Anyway, there we go. Well, where on earth did all this come from? Oh, being distracted and being attracted. So here we go, verse 22. Then he said to his disciples, so he's still talking to his disciples, not to the crowd. And that gives you the clue, really, that this is um, a series of sayings that are said to the disciples, not as part of the general preaching thing. When the Lord preached, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, and any preacher who's not making really the, the meat and drink of his preaching, those words, some Onofrio, yes, see, um, um, any preacher is not making repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The meat and drink of his or her preaching is not actually preaching the gospel. Okay, other people turned up. Good morning, Hal. God bless you and Christina. Um, therefore, I say to you, now remember. I say to you, this is something that has the force of an oath. Um, we've had that earlier on, um, a few days ago, exactly the same words. Do not worry about your life. And this is this word here that is often um, take no thought or don't be anxious. Uh, or don't be distracted. And it's really about being distracted. Do not be distracted about your life. Do not be distracted about what you will eat. Do not be distracted about your body, what you will put on. Okay? Um, St. John Chrysostom says, doesn't mean to say you go around naked. Doesn't mean to stop eating. Neither does it mean you stop working. Okay, uh, what it does mean is this though, don't have your mind fixed on earthly things, because they don't matter, they're not important. The Lord says, verse 23, life is more than food, your body is more than clothing, indeed you are made in the image and likeness of God. Okay, wealthy people fill their lives, particularly if they're not working, with all sorts of distractions. And you think, you know, why do you have a hobby as a pastime? Something to pass your time. Uh, why, do you, why do people do all sorts of things like needlework and stuff to fill in the idle moments? Because they ha they're not praying. They're not doing things they should be doing. They're not spreading the gospel. They're not preaching. They're just um, playing computer games or they're listening to music or there's something I heard on the radio yesterday on the way from Worcester to Lincoln, which was so funny, really. They were talking about um, culture of the 1990s, and this person going on about, you know, the way that people's minds are absolutely full of this particular issue nowadays. And I was thinking, not around where I live, they're not. <laughs> you never get another thought. Um... You know, how the how the 1990s had changed the way everything worked and blah blah blah. Say, so, well, it might do among certain people in certain parts of of London or have nothing better to do with their lives. But actually, if you come to Lincolnshire, people are too busy simply getting any sort of food on the table. Actually, life is more so. Um, wealthy people fill their time decorating their plates with fancy food going out to various uh, places to uh, entertain themselves at the latest theatre, the opera or the cinema, they can't bear to miss what's on at the Odeon next week and so on. Um, and they have all these distractions. Or they're covering their bodies with um, uh, fancy clothing straight from London and Paris and New York and so on. Um, it was... Oscar Wilde, who said that fashion is a form of ugliness so intolerable that it has to be changed every six months. <laughs> um, and we need to think about it in that sort of way. You know, there's, there's a, I'm always amused when I go to see my sister, that the, if we watch um, 
on television. Actually, they don't really. They decide what to watch, then they go to sleep. <laughs> they theoretically watch on television um, um, cookery programs, endless cookery programs, uh, food that looks perfectly indecent. Um, and they do ridiculous things to the food, like pile it all one thing on top of another. Thinking, I could spread over the plate actually, see what I'm eating. Uh, and a, a little tiny squidge of um, raspberry sauce, which they call a coolie. Um, there are various other things I have no idea what the words are. Was there a little thing about the other day? Yeah. I remember my father saying that he liked a little bit of food with his meal. <laughs> he got to some posh restaurant. Anyway, that's that's something different. So you can easily get completely distracted by things that really don't matter. It's one of the things I like about being a priest, actually. Um, I get up in the morning, I know exactly what I'm going to be wearing. I'm going to be wearing this. <laughs> uh, I have to say that uh, I have noticed, and I'm slightly... Uh, at fault here too, that um, clergy clothing has really gone up market, um, particularly vestments over the last um, 30 years. Um, the time one was when they all looked rather homespun, but they now look, um, and indeed, they, they are covered with all sorts of spangles and bits and bobs nowadays that uh, 25 years ago, we'd have thought was rather a feat. Anyway, um, the even clergy have fashions. <laughs> so there we go. Honestly, consider the ravens, says the Lord, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Now, ravens, the Greek word is rather interesting. It's an onomatopoeic word, and it's uh, korakas. So it's the, it's the name, it's a, korakas, korakas. Um, it's, the, it's the word they say, rather like English cuckoo. You know what a cuckoo is? Because it calls its own name. Uh, Kikos in, 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 uh, in Cyprus is the monastery named after the cuckoo. So korakas, the ravens. At the time of Christ, they were thought to be notoriously careless about their young. Um, they lay their eggs and they sit on them, and then they forget all about the babies and off they go. Um, and um, there are even some people, I think it's uh, Theophilus says, that baby ravens, they're not fed by their parents, and this is really where, where this comes in. Baby ravens are not fed by their parents. They just open their mouths and food blows into them by the will of God. And they close their mouths and they swallow, and that's all that needs to be done. So this is part of the background here, that the bone idle ravens, who were careless and hopeless parents, even then God feeds them. Okay? They neither sow nor reap, they don't have storehouse nor barn, and they just open their mouths and, and the <laughs> food blows in, and God feeds them. Um, and ravens were not important. They shoot them out of the sky with catapults and eat them. But actually, I don't think they did eat ravens. I think they were unclean. Um, but Jesus says, of how much more value are you than these birds? And these birds, these things that don't even bother feed their own babies. And it's interesting the Lord chooses a raven, something unclean and unimportant rather than something magnificent. I don't know, like a gazelle or a lion or a, a elephant or some, an elephant or something like that. Okay? Doesn't choose that. He wants you to see there's something of no consequence. And yet we're much more important than that. Verse 25. And 26. And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Now, this is actually quite an interesting verse, a couple of verses. Which of you, 
by worrying, so far so good, by being distracted, can add, so far so good, one cubit. Oh, oh, now we have a problem. Now, cubit and stature here can be interpreted from the Greek in two quite different ways. And I think this is not a good way of, of, um, of um, interpreting it. The better way, I think, is like this. And which of you can, being distracted or worrying, can add one day or one hour to his life, to his time, to his statute, so that his length of life? Which of you, by worrying, can add any time to the end of their life? The answer, of course, is nobody can. Our lives come to its conclusion. Uh, our life is fulfilled. It becomes completed. And that's it. We curl up our toes and we plop down dead. Um, or something similar. Um, and that's the end of that. Fun while, it, fun while it lasted, we might think. Think, well, hopefully, of course, it, it lasts forever. Uh, hopefully, that will be forever with Christ, which is a wonderful thought. Okay? Um, so who can add an hour to their life? Nobody can. Um, but even even then, even then, in extremity, a lot of people at the end of their days, as their life comes to completion, are concerned about their life. Okay? So, if you can't even affect your own life, your own body, or the height, if that's what it really means, poof, what can it be? Can I do that? Why are you anxious about the rest? Can't even add an hour to your life, so why are you worrying about a house or decorating or clothing or fashion? Consider the lilies, verse 27, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I say to you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Um, what fantastic, picturesque language the Lord has. In one lung full of air, he describes how the beauty and futility of flowers, how beautiful they are. Even Solomon's not dressed like that. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. How much more will he clothe you, or you of little faith? Very short-lived. And that's why it is, I think, that the thing about adding an hour to your life is the important, uh, is the correct translation of that. Very short-lived things, flowers. Uh, here today, gone tomorrow. And if you're somewhere like uh, uh, in a desert, well, Joan will tell you that if you go to Lebanon in the spring, the fields are absolutely filled with spring flowers, filled. And yet you pass by a month later or so, and it starts getting hot, and they've all dried up to nothing. And underneath all of the olive trees, people have been digging in order so that these plants don't catch on fire and set fire to the olive trees. But you can take these things up and use them to light your fires. Okay, beautiful. Here today, gone tomorrow. Um, and if God can do that to these things, how much can he do more for you? Um, just a little aside, really, about that. We're the only creatures that really put clothing on. And in the Garden of Eden... <laughs> Adam and Eve walked naked with Christ in the garden. It's not too far-fetched to think that Christ maybe walked naked with them too. The beauty of a human body, that's everybody's body, is in the image and likeness of God. Okay? And the human body... What it means to be this particular hypostasis is a beautiful and wonderful thing. And you see in different people 
that beauty of them coming out. And we make ourselves ugly, that is true. Um, but you see, I mean, when I lived in um, parts of Africa where people are quite often naked, and you see people of every age naked, um, you would see the, the way that somebody's life is written all over, not just their face, but their entire body. Um, you would see men and women who were coming to the fullness of their life, where their bodies had worked really hard, and they were tough and sinewy people, um, and they'd be sitting there on some stool, um, clothed in often very little. And uh, there's something dignified and beauty, beautiful about them, about them themselves. We, we tend to forget, or we've been persuaded that um, humans are not really beautiful, or there's something perverse about the human body that needs to be hidden away. Um, you know, when Adam and Eve tore the um, leaves off the trees and made clothes off them, and by that doing, causing the first death by killing the leaves, uh, this was um, a cover-up, not so much of their nakedness, but of their shame in going away from God. So, you know, um, if we want a good body image, it's because we're in the image and likeness of God. I used to say to the kids when I was teaching them that when God looks in the mirror in the morning to shave, <laughs> then what he sees staring back at him is the fullness of humanity and sees every one of us looking back, um, because all of us are that image and likeness of God. Okay? Um, so everybody in the image and likeness of God, if we look with God's eyes at ourselves, what we see is astonishing beauty, really astonishing beauty. Same true, of course, with God's creation. When God looked, he said, it was, it was good. When he finally made human beings, he said, it is very good. Um, so we need to have that in our minds. Um, so we trust God, and God will feed you. Okay? So, verse 29. The Lord continues. This is another little aphorism. A big aphorism, and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind, distracted mind, for all these things the nations the world seek after, and your father knows that you need these things. Okay, the nations the world, this is the Gentiles, these are things the Gentiles are after, people who are not religious. I sit here, I can hear the roaring of cars going past, people rushing to and fro. Uh, in the morning, you see people going along the, the road, um, nothing like as fast as they do in London, might say, uh, much more countryfied out here in Lincoln, um, but plodding along the road, taking time to speak with each other and do things. Um, but they are filled with the desire to do things of this world. And this world and everything to do with it, um, in the psalm it says, will be folded up like an old rag. <laughs> and pass away like an old rag. Um, so concentrate on those things that are really important. God knows you need somewhere to live. God knows you need clothing, particularly in a cold and wet and miserable country like this one. God knows that you need uh, food, and God will supply it as is necessary. That's when we greedily overeat, and we greedily overconsume, and we greedily buy expensive things uh, that are not good for us. That is when we get ourselves into all sorts of problems, financial and other. There we go. Um, so separate yourself 
Love anxiety of external things. Don't make your goal things that are ephemeral. God knows what you need. Um, C.S. Lewis says something I don't quite agree with, but I saw a friend of mine, Dariush, put this on Facebook this morning. Dariush came to live with me for a bit when he was about 15. Um, so I know Dariush pretty well. And um, Dariush put this on his Facebook thing earlier on today. Uh, C.S. Lewis, seek the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. So it's a meditation on that. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. Now, that's good. But I think the Lord is going straight. He's going further than that, isn't he? So I'll just read what C.S. Lewis wrote again. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. But the Lord is saying something stronger than that. Um, rather difficult, maybe, for a middle-class Englishman to grasp, like me, which is, aim at heaven and earth will seem insignificant to you. Okay, all the things of this world will just seem insignificant, no longer important. Rightly tighty, that's enough, I think, for today. Um, we all know who to pray for, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to pray for them. And meanwhile, we shall have a look at this. Uh, Suzanne St. Onofrio, yes, that is St. Humphrey. Uh, it was indeed his feast the other day, and um, when I was saying his name in the blessing at the end, I couldn't help myself but have a, uh, a naughty little smile, trying not to make it come out of both sides of my mouth. Uh, and I was thinking of him looking like a big woolly, woolly fellow. <laughs> uh, good morning, Natalia. Um, you've been to Kikos? It's, it's a wonderful place, quite extraordinary. The Kikos you see on the outside, by the way, is not matched by the Kikos where the monks live, live themselves, where they actually live. Where they actually live is very, very simple. Very simple. On the outside, it is gold laid upon gold and mag magnificent and majestic tile work everywhere and um, mosaics and so on and so on. Go inside, things are quite different. Natalia says, one should never underestimate or be dismissive of fellow human beings, no matter what our subconscious prejudices might incline us towards, as we are all made in the image of God. Now, that is, a, apart from the fact this is true, it's also, I have to say in Italia, magnificent English. <laughs> no wonder you translate stuff. It's beautiful. Um, yes, Joe, lots of poppies and cyclamens and all sorts of other things I noticed when I was there before. Um, and seeing that beauty in each human being makes seeing it be marred by all sorts of ugliness all the more heartbreaking. That is true. Um, when we see people, you know, as this lovely little baby in church yesterday. In fact, there were several lovely little babies, a um, small boy and small girl. Apollinaria is the girl, and uh, the boy is called Philip, Philip Noah. Um, both of them very tiny, both of them absolutely beautiful, really beautiful. You look at it and think, there we have, as the Jews say, the whole universe entire within each of these two people, the two little ones. Um, and then... You think about some of the people, some of the beggars in the streets, believe it or not, Lincoln's got beggars on the streets, um, some of whom I know quite well. You think, and what did we do to that little baby? When somebody is born, he or she would be lovely, really beautiful. You want to pick them up and hold them, you want to cuddle them, keep them safe. And one bite at a time, bite by bite, bit by bit, we turn this person into a stinking beggar at the side of the road. 
how did we achieve that? And it's um, really shocking, really shocking. Okay. Um, Suzanne, many on so-called faith blogs show hate and intolerance to each other. They forget the all one image. Quite right. Um, <laughs> I find it. The Christian sites are horrific. <laughs> and some of the Orthodox Christian sites are even worse than the ordinary ones. You know, I think, how can you think about people in such a terrible way? Pile into each other in a vile way, um, dehuman, dehumanizing each other. Horrible. There will not be a liturgy on Wednesday, God willing, because unfortunately on Wednesday I am going to Cyprus. Um, but there we go. So I should be on my way to Cyprus. And I was thinking about doing it Tuesday. And I think I'm going to be in the muck sweat, actually. So there's not going to be one. I'd love to do a liturgy for St. Peter and St. Paul. Um, but there we are. We're on for the, the Apostles. By Thursday, I'll arrive very early. I'll be shattered, I think, so I won't even get to liturgy there in Cyprus. So, uh, there we go. Um, the road to Kikos is indeed an experience, especially if you are driving. Um, if you look up the British thing about driving in, in Cyprus, it says Cypriot driving is dangerous. <laughs> this is a uh, something of a... British understatement. A beautiful article written by Father Stephen Freeman in the US about how we are too distracted from the transcendent, even though as human beings we are all called to be wonder, called to wonder and be in awe. Yes, the countryside is lovely and the sides of the roads are precipitous. But in Christ we confess the transcendence became flesh and walked among us. It's a very beautiful article, Buna. Please send it. To, yes, please do send it to me on Facebook. Okay, Carl. Yes, please keep me in your prayers. Um, what do with the holiday? It's not going to be a holiday. <laughs> there we are. Right here. Um, if you could please pray for the monastery uh, that I belong to. We've got. Um, you know, there are always problems, but I don't normally try and concentrate on things that I need to sort out, help us to concentrate on Christ. Uh, that's always important. Uh, help us to be outward looking and generous to other people. This is very important. Ask, ask the Lord to make us concentrate on him all the time. And uh, hopefully one way or another we'll come to some sort of uh, equilibrium. Okay, and um, pray please that you know, for some wisdom for me as well all of this so, so I know what I should be doing okay just ask you to pray for that today God willing tomorrow maybe even Wednesday uh, we will carry on with this maybe not Wednesday I think I'll I know it won't be Wednesday Tuesday God willing tomorrow we'll, we'll um, do this again okay right out God bless you goodbye